Welcome back to the Swim Mastery Session, part of the 2020 Angel City Virtual Games, presented by the Hartford. I'm your host, 1980 U.S. Olympian Glenn Mills, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. I'd like to take this moment to thank the incredible sponsors who made this clinic possible. First, a huge thank you to the Hartford, the, preventing, the presenting sponsor of the 2020 Angel City Virtual Games. Another big thank you to the TFA Group, the Foundation of Global Sport and Development, and Swim Angelfish for sponsoring this session. So on Monday, we broke into teams and you had a chance to work with Paralympians, Olympians, and elite coaches on your skills and technique. I hope you all learned a lot and practice your new skills this week. Does anyone want to share their experience or something they learned this week? I know Tom really emphasized the importance of strengthening your core with the Russian twist. Did anyone work on those? Let us know in the chat if you tried something new. We're waiting. Go ahead, type in the chat. Go for it. We'll keep checking that just to make sure. So let's make this as interactive as possible. This is a great opportunity for some of you athletes to talk to some amazing athletes. So don't let it go by. All right, so today we're very fortunate to have our incredible coaches back and we want to share a bit more about their experiences and answer questions you might have about swimming or anything else. It's wide open. So while the coaches go around and introduce themselves and share the best place they've ever traveled for swimming, write any questions you have in the chat. So Josh, this is where you start to type names. We're going to start with Rudy. And if Rudy, if you could introduce yourself and tell us about your favorite place you've ever been to to swim, we'll get started with that. Rudy called me and said that he is training at the moment. Um, so he unfortunately won't be able to show today. All right. So I'm going to answer for Rudy. The, the best place he ever went to swim was a pool. <laughs> okay, there you go. Got to have it, right? All right. So, Roderick, you're next. Um, my favorite place to swim. Honestly, I'm an open water person. Um, and my favorite place of swimming, honestly, was Kona. Not going to lie. It was it was. Open water is a different monster um, and being in that clear water and seeing the wildlife and the day before the race I actually swam and saw 14 dolphins in a pod together swimming with, alongside and apparently that's good luck. So <laughs> it worked for me. Um, but if I had to say for a pool, my favorite place to swim and it might've been the venue was uh, Mexico City in 2017 um, for Worlds. Uh, the people were lovely, you know, they're just super polite and we had a good time. That's great. Thank you, Roderick. John? Well, I've uh, been very blessed throughout my swimming career to, to have visited many, many places, including the Soviet Union, um, all over Europe, um, uh, South America. But I'm going to share with you probably my most notable trip. And another reason I'm sharing it is because Glenn and I were roommates during that trip. And that was our trip to China in 1980 after both of us making the 1980 Olympic team. There are so many memorable events that happened in a place that had previously been more or less shut off to Western, Western people. Um, one, one time I was hiking alone up in the mountains and a man approached me breaking, speaking very broken English and he said, um, I've never spoken to an English speaking person before, and I am the English professor at the local university. It was just, China was so different 40 years ago uh, than it is today. Um, and then of course, Glenn and I, even though we were heartbroken not being able to go to Moscow, we shared an amazing amount of laughs between ourselves and the rest of our teammates. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's something I will never forget, you know, the resilience of everybody um, realizing that their dreams had to be put on hold. Um, and it was just a, an amazing, amazing trip. I think I remember that. 
getting old, so. Mallory? Hi guys, I'm Mallory Wegman. Um, it's good to see all of you. I'm looking around my screen to see some familiar faces from Monday, but my favorite place that I traveled to to swim, oh my goodness. Um, honestly, I think London was probably the favorite pool that I've raced in. So that's kind of what's making it my favorite place right now is we, we ha I had the honor of racing there in 2012 during the games, but then just recently being back in 2019. And I think part of what for me has made it my favorite is just seeing the transformation that London hosting the games in 2012 had on society for individuals with disabilities in the UK. And then going back in 2019 and seeing how much time had passed since those games, but how much those games were still an integral part of society and the legacy that they left, you know, seven years later. And so I think that's probably one of my favorite places. Um, I don't know. I've been really fortunate to go a lot of places, but I'm going to go with London right now. Excellent. Thank you. Is Dave here? Just wondering, he may have had practice. Okay. So I'm next. John stole mine. So <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, so as Mallory uh, said, you know, and, and Roderick and John, we've had such great opportunities. I think my, one of my favorite trips was to be able to compete in South Africa in 1984. Now we were invited to go to South Africa in 1984. This is when apartheid was still the, the practice. And so by going there, we knew we were going to be kicked out of the sport for two years because they assumed that we supported apartheid. We made sure that we did a clinic for uh, about 70 young black swimmers to show that we didn't support apartheid. What we went for was to support their Olympic athletes that were not allowed to leave the country and compete because many of us knew what it felt like because of the boycott in 1980. So one of my favorite trips was that I ended my sport supporting athletes and supporting kids. And um, it was one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. And it was just great. So my, my favorite trip was South Africa. Uh, now I know Leticia is here, Leticia. You're still on mute, just to make sure. Yeah. There you go. Hello? Yep. Can you hear? Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Leticia. Um, my, it's great to be back again, of course. Thank you guys for having me again. Um, but my favorite place that I've gotten to travel to, uh, listening to all those stories was really awesome. But I do... It's a hard choice because I've gotten to travel to some great, great places, and I'm super blessed for that. Um, but my favorite currently, this today at this moment, is um, Denmark in 2017. We went there for a World Series. And um, the reason why that was my favorite was because I actually got to stay for two days after with uh, some of my teammates and some of my friends and we got to kind of go explore Denmark and they had such really good food and we got to take a little train and we went to Sweden for a few hours and ate at a restaurant there when we went it was it was nighttime so and it was a really small town in Sweden and it was pretty pretty empty we got off the train and we were like oh the streets are kind of bare there's nobody here um but we still went to a restaurant and had really, really good food. And I remember drinking the best orange juice of my life at that swim meet. They had this, like, vending machine of oranges at the lobby of the swim meet. And oh, the best orange juice ever. Nothing can compare. And I also had a really good swim meet. I just had really good times. And I was happy with my um, with my 50 free and my technique and things that I had been working on, I finally got to see come to a reality. Um, and so, yeah, that one was my favorite. I just have such, such great memories. And that was my last international meet that I've gotten to go on. And that was my favorite so far. Fantastic. Thank you, Leticia. Josh? I am not a swimmer. I'm not going to lie. I'm here just as a great guest, and I'm listening to all the athletes. Uh, my experience is with a uh, goalball, the sport of goalball, for those of you who are aware. But I did really, really enjoy 
uh, learning about swimming, especially from Leticia and learning about more about athletes who are blind and the adaptations they use for swimming. So that was super, super cool for me. Very cool. Thank you. I might skip over Tom. He never has anything to say. Nope. No, I'm good. Yeah. My backyard pool. It's a great, no. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. So good to see you guys again. Um, man, I can think of like a different pool for every different kind of favorite memory. You know, um, obviously I got to go back to Beijing in 08 competing in the games in the cube. The cube was incredible. I had just got to watch, we were in Japan when Phelps went historic and won eight gold medals. Um, but I'd never seen two 10 lane 50 meter pools in the same venue before. So that was pretty wild to even be a part of that. Um, and just, you know, being in, in Japan, uh, at the Kadena air force base for a month and being able to, I just can, I can still feel hugging my parents for the first time when they made it to Beijing and we got to see each other again and see my family and, and to get in the race in that cube was just, uh, absolutely memorable. Um, I think about actually a year prior to that too. Uh, I was in Rio for the 2007 Pan Am Games, and that was my first international trip. Um, and we had to really assimilate to the culture there. It was pretty cool. We didn't have the same athlete village that you would have had at the games or in, in most international competitions now. So, you know, we were eating a lot of the local culture, cuisine, and really having to adapt. And it was just fun to be able to just let yourself go for it and just see what happens. So it was, it was really cool. I think I could, like Glenn said, I could talk forever about plenty of memories. So. Beijing will stick out though for, for a very, very long time. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Aileen, I see you posted. Let's, let's hear about the, the lake. Well, it's not as fancy as another country, but I'm sure Cindy will agree. Um, we used to run an overnight sleepaway camp at Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, and that is probably my most favorite place to swim. It's cool, it's fresh, it's clean, you know, it's outdoors, it's surrounded by mountains, it's just beautiful. Fantastic, thanks. Now Cindy will have to confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a favorite place, but I'm so inspired and so, so happy that we're involved with everybody and from the 80s Olympics to really impaired, physically impaired, all the things and all the stories you guys have, but. I think that along the lines of the culture of the other places, Aileen and I had the opportunity to teach special needs adaptive swim, swim whispers in Spain. And, and there's such a, a more loving, free, touching place to be. And there we are in the pool and their congratulations and thank you was to put us on a, a flowing mat <laughs> and 150 people went around us and literally threw us up in the air like a trampoline in their beautiful outdoor pool. And that was one of the most astonishing outdoor pool things I think that's ever happened to Aileen and I together anyway. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. So let's see who else has some questions for these great coaches and athletes that we have. We definitely want to open it up to the athletes that are here. Um, so because the group is, is not as big, if you want to go ahead and just unmute yourself, if you want to ask a question to pick anybody, um, we want to go ahead and kind of open that up. And even to the point where Rob had talked about, uh, Rob, you talked about doing the, um, the, the exercise with the tether this week. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Put you on the spot there. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, I'm not cleaning the garage. <laughs> but um, I, uh, we, we just got a new, uh, new treadmill. But um, I, uh, yeah, I got out my pool with the, with the swim tether just tied to the, um, to the rail or whatever you call it. The, um, yeah, the rail. And uh, I, I try to do it pretty often. But um, yeah, just some of the techniques you guys have talked about with um um, the catch, you know, not being straight out, but being more at a, at an angle down towards the bottom of the pool. Um, just using some of those techniques helped a lot. Tether is kind of funky because, you know, you're not, you're swimming in place and it kind of, you know, it's pulling against you. But, um, but I, but <laughs> in my mind, remembering how it's like normally, uh, it, it helped me get back to some places and I felt more of a catch, uh, out there. So it was good. That, that's great. I, I have done a, because I have such a short pool in the backyard, it's only 14 feet long, but it's an endless pool. But I did some videos on tethering during COVID 
And one of the things that I think helps a lot is uh, because to avoid the churn, do some sculling with paddles, um, you know, get some surface area going. And so just, it's a little bit more engagement. Sometimes if you're just churning the water, you lose a little bit of that feel. So just be careful that if you're tethering to make sure that you're doing some feel exercises as well. But, you know, it's like whatever we can do at this point, right? Yeah, I do a lot of sculling drills with uh, with with different toy. I have all the different toys that I yeah. Excellent, thank you. So let's see, who's going to be next? Do I have to pick on somebody like Francisco so he can ask a he can ask a uh, a triathlon question? We've got we've got some cyclists here. We've got you know, so. I put you on the spot, Francisco. What do you think? You want to tell us what you did this week, or do you have any questions for some of the athletes? Well, uh, what I've been working a lot is my rotation because uh, I see that while I'm swimming, I I start to lose like my head position, so I'm focusing on that not to lose like I I see that when I'm tired, I start to take a breath like take out my shoulder a lot, so I try not to move my head. Like, well, what, what we talked about uh, of the neck, uh, the neck position and uh, of the shin, so I try to work on that. Uh, so not really a question, but more like I, I'm putting my attention on that. Try to not move my head a lot because I do, I do a lot of that uh, after uh, after I'm tired. Got it. Thank you. I'm trying to be nice and I forget to turn it back on. Um, <laughs> so when we talked last week or earlier this week, you know, you had the great opportunity to listen to Mallory and Dave. And since Dave isn't here, we're going to go to Mallory and we're going to talk about that kind of that stable head position. And then, uh, you know, anything specific that you need to focus on. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. And Francisco, it's fun to hear that you're playing with that. Um, for you guys who weren't in our breakout group on Monday, one of the things that we talked a lot about, and it was specific to individuals with spinal cord injuries, but this really applies to all of us as swimmers, regardless of if we have an impairment or don't, frankly, um, was that conversation around body position. and where Dave and I both spoke with the group about it is that transition that both him and I had from going from being, I hate this term, but we've said numerous times, it's the only one we know, from being an able-bodied swimmer to incurring an impairment and now being an adaptive swimmer. And so one of the things that, that I worked a lot on after my injury was this realization that obviously, so I'm paralyzed, I don't have a kick anymore. And so how can I kind of manipulate my body in the water to be as a efficient as possible. And one of the things that's really important that often we kind of neglect is everything in our core between essentially as much core as you have. So if you have your full core, utilize every bit of it you have. If you only have half of your core for some reason, utilize all the way down to the bottom of what you've got up to the top of your head and your neck falls in there. And so do shoulders and posture and all those things. And so how do you kind of connect that whole area while you're swimming and utilize that to really help you. Because one of the things that I always say as my comparison is when I had all four limbs working for me, it was really easy to forget about the middle section of my body when I swam. And then when I was paralyzed and I lost the control of my legs and the lower part of my core, I realized that the way in which to assist my legs through my swimming and kind of get my butt up in the water and do those things I needed it came through my chest movement and my head position. And so when you guys are swimming, you know, some swimmers have to swim a little more flat because rotation's really hard based on what core function they have. And then some swimmers can get great rotation, but whatever, whatever body parts you have that do or don't work for you, that's an area that we talk about to just really hone in on and not neglect. And like Glenn was talking about, Rob, for you and with tethering and just kind of sculling when I tethered during COVID for a while, that was my only access to water, as I'm sure so many people have experienced themselves. 
there was a lot of sculling and then I used a snorkel. And honestly, I spent more of my time not so focused on how do I get my cardio up because I can do that on land, but just focused on laying in the water, as silly as that sounds, and working on kind of that postural feel as it relates to being in the water and my head position and what I like to call my kind of chest undulations. So for breaststroke and butterfly, that's how I get my body to still kind of create a movement, even though I don't have control of my lower core and legs. And so just playing with that and all our bodies are so different that what I do is maybe not going to work for you. Like Francisco, you were playing with like, how do you kind of figure that out? And it's such a feel thing. And we talked a lot about that idea of don't get discouraged in it. I've been injured for 12 years. I'm doing things now as a 31 year old athlete, totally different than I ever did 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I was doing things different then. And so it's just, it's that constant learning curve and choosing to kind of continue to be, be willing to learn and adapt because even when you master it today, I'm not saying this in like a negative way, but in a year or two, you might have to readapt it because things change or you now know something you didn't know now. So I think that's a big piece kind of for all of us and fits into probably what Tom was working on with Russian twists and just really that core control through throughout and as swimmers gosh it's it's the most important part of what we do i could talk about it all day long yeah no i actually want to add on to that because francisco came to my workout on wednesday and he talks about how he swims the 400 which you and i both know is just a, a lovely race and um i was going to say francisco um that whole idea that Mallory was talking about even with the breaststroke and butterfly about pressing your chest through another great way that I know I worked on that when I was in like the back half of my 400 like that last 300 and 400 meters um those last 200s where I was just trying to do anything I could because like Mallory was talking about when we roll and we and we you know make sure we're keeping everything in line that still fatigues right especially in a five minute race it gets pretty worn out and so doing that option there of trying to help undulate yourself through your stroke as you get into the later part of that 400, it's a really good thing to think about and try when you can get back in a pool because you might find it's a really good way to help compensate your hip loss um, as it pops them up, even without having to really use your hips when they get tired. So just something to think about. Tom brings up a really good point on that for, for you guys of just, and Tom, you can, you can relate to this, no matter how good you are with breathing, when you don't have a kick, your hips drop. Like, oh, yeah there's no way around it and it's going to happen. And so then how do you overcompensate for that? How do you get as quick of a breath as possible? And one thing that we've been playing with to Tom's point is that idea of almost doing that kind of undulation once the head's yeah. back, like once you're back in position after that, right after that breath, kind of give yourself that kind of quick, it's almost like a little pop yeah. to get everything yeah. back yeah. up. And then, you know, the less you have to breathe, usually the, the better. So work on some of that breath control. <laughs> so, um, Josh, what you just posted right there as far as, um, you know, the biomechanics of each individual is so important. Leticia and I r were reminiscing uh, after Monday about how I had gone to the OTC to work with the, uh, the team. And here I am, uh, you know, most of the time dealing with, uh, able-bodied swimmers with, with no issues other than, you know, regular issues that they have. Um, and I'm standing in front of her respecting um, the, the distance that a coach should have from an athlete. I'm standing in front of her motioning, okay, now your hand should go like this. And I could see this confusion on her face. And I finally said, oh my gosh, can I touch you? And she just like immediately, she just said, please. So, um, so I was able to manipulate her into these positions. But Leticia, I think one of the things that you had said that ties into what Mallory said that I think is so important for every athlete, but especially those of you that are really discovering things, is your last competition you had, you said everything finally came together after all those years of work. And I think that ties back into what Mallory said. So, and then uh, what Josh had just posted about, especially for blind athletes learning and tweaking, how did you experience changes and how did you try to, you know, uh, feel things to, especially for body positioning or length or whatever it is? Uh, what was your process? We were on, then we were off. She's back on mute. 
There you go. Nope. One more time. Still on mute. There it is. Good. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and for me, a big struggle that I had through most of my um, career since I learned completely blind, um, I never knew what the strokes looked like and nobody ever took me early on in my swimming career. They never took me and showed me with my body. They just explained it uh, auditorily. And so I just kind of had to make assumptions. And so obviously my assumptions were very wrong because with swimming there are, I mean, there's so many technical things that you can do even in freestyle. I mean, it, with where you enter your hand, how far you rotate, how high you pick up your head to breathe, how you keep your head straight when you're swimming, um, how you kick your legs with your hips and not just using your knees and your ankles. Um, so there's just so many things. And so, um, you know, I had gotten to the point in 2012 where I had only been swimming for three years. So technique really wasn't a huge thing for me at that point. My coaches were kind of focusing more so on my, on my cardio. And once I got to Rio, cardio obviously wasn't as big as the thing and being in shape and having the stamina to finish a hundred freestyle or 200 IM and stuff wasn't as big of a thing. And so technique became more of a thing, but trying to break those habits that I had already created was just really challenging and finding somebody who could actually show me the proper way to do it was very challenging. So I would say probably a few years before Rio, probably like a year is when I really started breaking down my technique and trying to fix it. And it was just very frustrating for me because obviously I couldn't fix it in just a year. I had to I had to break habits of five, six years, seven years by that point. And so I was very frustrated because I couldn't get to the times that I knew physically and shape wise that I could, but technique wise, I, I couldn't, I wasn't as efficient as I know I could be. And so I would work on technique for each stroke for a certain amount of time. So like for breaststroke, I would just focus on one thing for a few weeks or a few months and get that fixed. And then I would kind of progress and add something else on. So it was a very slow process, but I could only focus on one thing at a time because while you're swimming, you're also thinking of, of the workout that you're doing and, you know, okay, I have to swim fast right now. I have to kind of go a little bit easier in this part of the workout. I need to focus on my breath control. And so focusing on, one piece of technique is kind of all you can do to maximize your your effort and your stroke. So it took a very, very long time because there's four strokes and I had to fix all of them. And I never really was able to fix my backstroke. My coach kind of gave up on that one on me. He said, I, I'm just not meant to do backstroke. Um, so fixing all those strokes, we would, like I said, we would fix one thing and we would just hyper focus on that throughout my workout. So sometimes I wouldn't do the same workout that everybody else would do. I would just kind of spend 30 minutes of practice just trying to fix that one piece of technique. And so it's very frustrating um, just because it's hard to fix those things. And it was hard for me, especially because I was like, well, I can't do the same workout that everybody is doing like I feel like I'm kind of slacking off but I had to remind myself that I needed to fix this technique and now was the time to do it and that needed to be my focus more so than completing the exact same workout as everybody else and so finally for 2017 when I finally broke 32 in my 50 freestyle and I have been trying to break that for four years it was just awesome my rotation was finally great so that was something that I had been working on my kick from my whole hips and using my whole legs that was finally great and my head positioning was really good I didn't go very crooked in that swim race I think I only made contact with the lane rope like 
maybe once or twice and it didn't break my stroke. It was just kind of a to use as a device to know where I was. And so all of those things just kind of finally pieced together in those 31 seconds and I was able to finally see the work being done. But even though that I had done that then, um, for my next 50 free races, sometimes I would still go back to old habits. So it was still something that I, I had to work on. I didn't quite master it yet. I have just gotten a little bit better. And I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Right. Very cool. Thank you, Leticia. Um, Elizabeth had a question about breathing. Elizabeth. Hello. Great to be here. So my question has to do with how you use your lungs with breathing. What type of breath are you guys using? Are you, um, are you taking it deep into your lower lungs? Are you, are you messing? Are you, do you have techniques for actually breathing besides just inhaling and exhaling and when and, and uh, how many you do? Do you know what I'm saying? Does it matter if you're taking it into your lower lung or your upper lung or your chest? How do you guys do that? Roderick, you wanna, you wanna take this? Because I think it's very important, especially if you're out in the middle of the ocean, making sure that you have good oxygen exchange, so. For sure. Um, one thing I've learned about open water swimming, uh, sighting has been a big issue for me. Um, it's always been an issue when it comes to when I'm supposed to actually start my turn and, and get my breath. For me, what I've always Did he lock up? Roderick, you're locked up a little bit. Yeah, we'll give him a second to come back. Yeah. If he can't get back, then um, let's see, who did I want to go to next? Tom. So Roderick, see if you can uh, refresh. And uh, Tom, if you can take the breathing question, please. Sure, absolutely, happy to help. Um, so I think we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday too, Elizabeth. And when we think about breathing, I think it's really important, especially when I feel like I'm teaching somebody that's new to swimming how to breathe, it's very easy for them to get very short with their breath right away because they but feel- But I'm not new, I'm-, I'm like, No, I know, I know, I'm gonna get there, I got you, don't worry, yep. And, and so, when, when they start breathing, they hyperventilate a lot because they feel like when they're in the water, they need to hold their breath. And they have that misnomer where if, my, if I'm underwater, I don't breathe, right? When we all know as swimmers that you constantly breathe at a consistent, steady rate, um, even when your face is in the water. And so for me, I feel like some of it is always going to be a situation where you're going to acclimate to what's comfortable for you. Um, we talked about the idea of breathing every three strokes and we're breathing to both sides. We have fluidity in both and both that roll motion and comfort to breathing both sides. I know when I swim, I kind of felt like when I would breathe from my left side, I had a little bit of a longer stroke. And when I breathe to my right side, I had a little bit more of a power stroke. So I'd be able to kind of variate between the two as I needed, depending on what race I was swimming or what part of a race I was in. Um, but nonetheless, I felt like my focus was always on making sure I was exhaling enough when I was turning and rotating to breathe. Um, I often would find that if I'm not breathing deep enough that I would start to build lactic acid quicker. I could feel it in my legs, even though I wasn't using them as much, I would build lactic acid quicker because I wasn't taking the time to finish through my roll or finish through my stroke because I was rushing my breath too much. And so it's about taking that time to feel that right point of inhale that as you're coming back into rolling, you can start your exhale as you're still rolling your face into the water. You can kind of start cheating that system a little bit where you get a little bit more time to start exhaling because you can still exhale while you're face is out of the water. I know it might seem like, no, you only inhale when your head is out and you in exhale when your face in the water. You can variate the two a little bit to help you kind of maximize that exhale point where you feel like when you go to breathe, it's not rushed and it's not like you're having too much CO2 in your body when you're trying to exhale because you have inhale, inhaled so much. You have enough time to reset your system. So like I was saying, I think if you can work on exhaling a little bit as you start rolling into the water, you might find a little bit more comfort that by the time you're ready to breathe again, you feel like you actually need to breathe and, and inhale. One of the things that I use, uh, and again, Elizabeth, not to, to say you're at the beginner level, but making the breathing visceral, making it uh, something that you focus on. And so if you close your mouth and hum, 
pretty much the entire time while your face is in the water, you're actually exhaling. And it becomes something that become, you become more aware of it. Um, you know, what, what I'd like to hear from is Cindy and Aileen, because you guys are going to deal with breathing issues, uh, you know, and how to explain to someone. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I, I'm so happy that you asked because I'm I feel like you just read our mind. I'm privately <laughs> chatting Aileen. <laughs> I figured. Yeah, we, we use that technique, Glenn, that you just talked about a lot with humming and making it, we call it more proprioceptive. So you're more aware and you're getting feedback to the exhalation. But the water has this like magical property of hydrostatic pressure. And the, the deeper you go, the more pressure is around your body. So even just doing a breathing exercise where you do a deep water bob as you're humming and ex exhaling. And then when you break the surface of the water, getting more of an inhalation to use that hydrostatic pressure to kind of give you more input in a way as to how to regulate your breathing. And if Did and you want to add? Yeah, the other thing I think, and I hope this is going to answer your question a little bit, but if, if you're trying to, it sounds like maybe you're trying to reorganize the patterning of your breathing or reorganizing some of the rhythm because you do have swimming experience that if you if you do those deep water bobs in some kind of repetition and rhythm then after that remind your body that flexion is going to help you exhale and extending your body is going to help you inhale so you can even use those body positions to help you with breath and sort of reorganize your your body to understand the way that it naturally had breath before and then work towards some of the other um, breathing drills that the coaches are talking about. I feel like, Amy, what else? Anything else? And Coach, when we have Roderick back. I saw Roderick's back, and we got to, we got to finish his thing. Thanks so much, Cindy and Aileen. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry about that, everyone. I think my Wi-Fi dropped on me. Um, it sounds like you got all the information you needed, though, <laughs> when it comes to swimming. Um, the only input I would give, uh, you know, a lot of this, a lot of these tools are what I use, um, either open water or in the in the pool. Um, one thing I've always told my swimmers when it comes to breathing and activating and knowing when to breathe, is to pretty much let your chin follow your elbow. So if I'm pulling back, the second I get to a certain point, if there's a string from my elbow to my chin, that reaction is going to be enough to get the right amount of turn that I need to get a breath. If you're swimming open water, you, you're gonna need to lift a little bit. And usually I like to do this when I'm sighting. So, you know, I'll take, you know, four, four strokes and then a breath, but I'm, I'm lifting a little bit because I naturally, you know, it's, there's waves out there. You're not gonna, it's not as calm and, and collected as the pool is. But um, after each, maybe your 20th stroke, you would take a breath, lift your head up and then dive back down into your stroke and, and finding your rhythm again while also still trying to find that, that balance of, do I lift my head too high? Am I lifting my head too high? Am I like not getting enough you know, air? Am I getting water in my mouth? Um, and it, it really varies. It, it's something that you need to work on and practice. Um, but yeah, I hope, uh, I hope these were some, some good tips for you. These, all these answers are so fantastic and they're making me so excited, the visualization and the feeling in my body to just be swimming right this moment. But are you guys taking super deep breaths are you bringing the breath down deep into your lungs or are you just doing it you know halfway or, or is that even something you're even thinking about i'm just wondering how deep a breath to try to take that you guys use for, for myself and yeah you know, this is what i do i take a it's usually quick but it's, it's strong so it's and then like we i love the humming idea the humming is you know that's kind of how yeah I it's find awesome. the rhythm um so that's literally what it is just a quick just a quick breath you only have enough time to get that breath but you need as much as possible so you're <gasps> you're taking in deep into your lungs right and then as you get down you you find that rhythm with your humming to get that I, I, so like battle, I like that so go ahead so, sorry well because with the skin diving and things that i did before my um you know problem with my lower limbs and things um the, taking is taking in the breath and regulating the breath and, and using your lungs as a muscle it, it influences your buoyancy tremendously and I was just curious in the competitive swimming areas and things that you're doing if, if that's something that you use getting getting full lungs or not or is it just what's the comfortable breath and timing of the breath more 
Elizabeth, here. this is Mallory here. Um, Hi, Mallory. I think you're hitting. I think you're hitting on something really important. And I would encourage all of you guys uh, when we talk about body position. For for me specifically, and again, everybody's body behaves differently in the water, but buoyancy with a spinal cord injury is, is very challenging just as I'm sure you know Roderick you you know missing both your legs there's a balance issue there Tom like all of us have this element of we're trying to figure out just at a baseline our buoyancy in the water and I think that that's really important and it was interesting when Tom was talking and he was talking about like beginners and gosh I'm going for my third games and so many of us has have so much experience in this sport but there's days where in training you still just have to act like you're a new kid in the water training and break it down to the very basic fundamentals because those are what allow you, no matter what level of your athletic career you're at, they're what allow you to then kind of like break it down, step backwards, focus on the very micro things so you can kind of dive back into it and bring it to where you're at. And Leticia, I think, hit on that really well. But mm -hmm. for breathing itself, I personally like to use breathing as a tool to aid in my buoyancy in the water. And so there are things you can do. Um, I hate to be the broken record. It is different for everybody's body because how that breath impacts your body. It's kind of like if any of you guys have been scuba diving and you go and you get down and you're scuba diving and you're trying to just like regulate where your buoyancy is. Some people need more air in their regulator. Some people need more weights on. Like everybody's body is going to do something a little different with that. And so it's kind of the same thing in the pool. Um, there are certain events where I feel like the less I breathe, if I get a really great deep breath and I've got some great breathing for the 50 fly before I dive in, I can crank out a 50 fly in one or two breaths if I really want to. And I'm actually able to get in an awesome rhythm, keep my undulation going, keep my core strong. And every time I go for that breath, I feel like I'm breaking my core and it takes me three more strokes to get it back. And so there are areas where you can do that, but obviously you can't do that in a hundred free or a 400 free. And so then you have to utilize it to where Tom was going of understanding how does that lactic acid build up depending on that breath. And then what kind of pattern is best for you? And I, I hate being vague in that, but I mean, I feel like we can all attest to like, it is trial and error. And gosh, I would love to tell you that I have the answer, but we just got our bonus year going into Tokyo, as many of you know. And let me tell you, figuring out my breathing pattern for my 400 free is like one of my things that I am determined is going to happen. Um, and this is my third games. So it, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes just doing basic stuff like floating in the water and playing with it. Um, but totally to your point, I do, I do strongly believe that you can use your breath as an aid in buoyancy in the water. For sure. Absolutely. Air is buoyant. And so how you use it is going to be important for everybody. Um, Josh, you had a question? Yeah, I have a quick question before we uh, start winding down for the raffle. I know everyone's getting excited for the raffle. But um, as somebody who's not a swimmer, uh, I used to run track in high school. And one of the, the perks is as a sprinter, the mental part of it was easy because during 100 meters, you don't really have time to think uh, everything just happens and it's done. Um, you know, same with the 200 and then you start getting up to the 400. So for swim races that take a little bit longer, what are some things that you guys do to mentally train and what do you try and focus on while you're swimming in the pool instead of just, wow, I'm getting tired. You know, how do you do that? Cause I think that comes into play a lot, especially in some of the longer races. So I was just wondering, I've always wondered what swimmers do with all that time to think in the pool. Um, oh, can I, can I okay. go? Yeah, sorry, Leticia. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I just, I kind of mentioned that briefly in my other explanation about uh, having like one, picking one thing to focus on while you're swimming, because if you focus on nothing, then you're not being as efficient as you can be in your race. And sometimes your mind can drift, even if it is a fast race, and you can't focus on more than one thing because then it's just too much for your mind and you're not as focused in on your on your race so what I like to do is I like to know what I do in my race so if it's like the hundred I know towards the end of the second 50 and the last 20 meters or 25 meters um 
something that I would do is I would get smaller with my stroke and I wouldn't grab as much water and I wasn't, I would just take like 20 million more strokes that I, than I would the first 50. And so something that I liked to focus on, especially when I knew I was getting tired was still having that long efficient stroke and still grabbing lots of water. So I would just pick a key word that I would practice with during practice that would help me, um, kind of remember and give my body that clue that I needed even though I was tired I still had to do that so I would just pick like one word or a phrase or something that worked for me during practice and if it worked for me during practice then I would utilize that during the race and that way I could still stay focused and even when I was tired I had something that I could focus on so that it wouldn't deteriorate as much as it could if you're not paying attention. Excellent. Thank you, Leticia. Yeah. Um, real quick. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll totally add to that. I think Leticia hit the point pretty head on uh, just with a different word that I was going to use strategies. Um, you know, oftentimes in practice, it's very easy just to think about getting through the set and going through things. But I always found with the 400 that I always had a distinct strategy of this is how I'm going to attack the first hundred. Here's how I'm going to push the middle 200. And here's how I'm going to, you know, race that last hundred. And my, my thing was always in practice was trying to mimic that strategy as much as possible and make that first hundred as efficient and smooth as I possibly could. And then knowing that I had to build through the middle 200 of that race. And really that's like the meat and potatoes and how well is that going? And just know as a competitive person, everybody in the heat with me is going to have their own strategy. And so it was nice to have them next to you to know like, okay, well, they're going to be able to push my strategy a little bit here. And they're going to say, Hey, they're going out pretty quick next to me in that first hundred. That's their thing maybe I can push mine a little bit, but know that I can still have room to get going on that middle 200. Um, Rudy and I actually are in the same disability class, so we were both S8s, and we shared many of 400 freestyles next to each other, and um, so we each had our own strategies, right? I have a, it, ironically, I have a much better flip turn than he does, you know, even though my legs aren't that great and I don't get a strong push, I physically have legs, and so I had a huge advantage on Rudy there on those turns, um, and so I knew I had to attack the walls when I was racing Rudy and I had to push that differently. And so your strategy can have some variation depending on who you're racing, but it's all about mimicking that and practicing that as much as you can in practice and looking at practice as a race rehearsal, no matter if you're doing eight, four hundreds in practice or you're doing one or you're doing 20 fifties, you know, taking that and trusting that when you go to your meet, your hard work is paid off and your strategy is going to be there for you when you need it. Excellent. Mallory, do you have something? I would just chime into that and what Tom's hitting on and what Leticia did. One thing that, that I work really hard on when it comes to the, the mental aspect of swimming, and this really goes for any sport, but training, as Tom said, it's your rehearsal. Like everything you do in the pool, in your training sessions, it's going to be autopilot when you race. You can't mentally fold in a repeat of 10 100s in training, but then somehow magically think that the last 10 meters, you're going to drive it home in a hundred meter when you're racing. And so one of the things that I, I do when I train is I work really hard on that mental aspect in terms of like, there are days where, let me tell you, in the middle of a set, I want to throw that towel in and every ounce of my body hurts. But if I can, in that moment, push my mind to be strong I know when I get behind the blocks for a race, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that I have not only the physical strength, but the mental strength to get through that race. And so I think there's that element of, I always tell people our minds give up far before our body ever will. And so if we can get our minds to show up the way we need to, we'll be able to perform the way that we, we know how to. And so when I, when I go into a race, I love Leticia's one word. I think that's such a great thing. And Tom with strategy um, I, I try to think as little as possible. I know that sounds horrible, but like, I trust that my body knows exactly what it's supposed to do because I trained it to do just that. And I think as little as possible. And I just let everything I've trained come to the surface and do kind of what it's done. And let me tell you, there are still races where it hurts so bad but more often than not at this point now, having worked really hard on that in my training, I usually don't realize how bad the race hurts until I've stopped racing. Once your hand hits that wall, it hits and you're like, whoa, everything's kind of shutting down. Mm -hmm. But I think what helped me get to that point is really honing in on that and training. Like Leticia said, focus on one thing, 
for a long time, my one thing was that. And um, I think that's a huge thing we can all do, give ourselves because racing's tough and the mental side of racing is no joke. Um, it's probably the biggest part of racing. And so finding little ways to figure out what your thing is. So you have that confidence when you go behind the block. So you're never in a situation where you're racing scared because the minute you race scared, you're in a whole lot of trouble. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I will confess that I didn't use one word. I used two words when I would go up to the blocks and those two words were John Moffat. So generally that's, that's what it would be. <laughs> or, I'd, or I'd picture him smiling after the race and then it would be like, ah, he did it again. But I mean, this is the thing about athletics. John and I were fierce competitors, but always, always great friends and still to today. So, um, that was a lot of fun. Thanks to everyone for your amazing questions and thanks for our coaches for sharing such interesting answers. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Really, really appreciate everybody being here.